Hello and welcome to another episode of What's Up Prof. Good day, Walter. Hi, Martin. Yes, we are here again. Are you okay? I'm okay, but it's we're going from bad to worse here, it seems. <laughs> That's how it is. The Bible says that will happen, but at least there is some hope. Yes. So let's open with a word of prayer and get on with it. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we can be here. Thank you for these wonderful truths that you present to us in your word. Help us to make sense of it and help us to understand these things and also to implement it in our lives and to, to reach the world with this message. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Martin, we've now completed the first, the second, and the third angel's message. And uh, they must do their work in the world, right? Yeah. And then comes this other angel, and he repeats the message of the second angel, mm. but with some additional pointers. Now, the second angel was an announcement that Babylon had fallen. And it gives the reason why they fell, because they imbibed of the wine of the first beast, mm -hmm. the Babylonian construct. They imbibed that wine, absorbed their doctrines, and moved away from the simplicity of God's word. Yeah. The third angel invites them back into the path of salvation outlined in the Bible, mm -hmm. as opposed to... Babylon's way. Yes. And then comes another angel, and it repeats that second angel's message. And it's to give power unto the third angel's message. Yes. So let's have a look at it. Revelation 18. It's a, it's a marvelous chapter. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. That's the same as the second angel's message. Yes. But then it tells us that they've become a habitation of devils and a hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So Babylon is controlled by demons. Yes. And Babylon has a false Holy Spirit. It's a foul spirit, and it's an unclean bird, mm. because the Holy Spirit is likened to a clean bird. It yeah. descend, descended upon Jesus like a dove, mm -hmm. which is a clean bird. But this is an unclean bird. It's a foul spirit. And why has this happened? Because the nations have drunk of the wine. Mm -hmm. They imbibe the wrong doctrines, the wrong plan of salvation, and humanity gobbled it up, yep. hook, line, and sinker. And that is why there's wrath. Not because God is vengeful, mm -hmm. but because they have separated themselves from the source of life. Mm. Now, who are the ones that have imbibed? The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. So, Martin, we must be careful of politics, right? That's it. Stay out of it because they all sit around the same table. And stay away from it. But we also get another bit of information mm -hmm. that the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Martin, the merchants of the earth are controlled by Babylon. Yes. That means who's the merchant? They are all the, p the financial places. The shopping centers, everything everything that has to do with money. Who controls the financial system? Babylon controls yeah. it. That's what it says in the Bible. So she's become a house of demons. She has a false Holy Spirit. They have false doctrines. And the kings of the earth are in cahoots with her and enforce her doctrines and her dictates. Mm. And the merchants of the world make sure that she becomes rich mm -hmm. and increased in goods, all kinds of goods, yeah. and humanity is enslaved. All right. Verse 4 says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. This is a general call to separate yourself from the Babylonian system. From this whole thing. And whose people? God's people. 
and you are not to be a partaker of her sins. Mm -hmm. Sin, by definition, is the transgression of the law. Yeah. They are against God's laws. Separate yourselves from them. Or else you're going to receive her plagues. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very potent message. And you either adhere to it or you forfeit eternal life. Why? Because the time has come where her sins have reached unto heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. Her iniquities throughout the ages. Yes. They're all recorded for in the, the Lord's book. For the whole period of 6,000 years that sin was permitted. Yes. And this Babylonian system, first in its pagan form, then in its Christian form, then in its conglomerate religious form, having swept all the systems into its midst, has to be exposed. Mm. And she's going to be destroyed. Yeah. Let's make sure. Sin is transgression of God's law. 1 John 3 verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Babylon is a lawbreaker. Mm. God's law is forsaken by them. We've dealt with it in great detail. Yeah. James 2 verse 9 says, But if you have respect to persons, ye commit sin. Mm. In other words, if I listen to them, then I'm a partaker of their sin. Yeah. If you acknowledge or do whatever they ask you to, you Correct. fall into that trap. Because they are breaking the law of God mm. and they are passing their wine chalice to you and say, drink and come and sin with us. So if I listen to their reasoning rather than to the reasoning portrayed in this book, I'm a partaker of their sin. And the thing is, most of the time, that will be the politically correct portion. Uh, yes, you will be very politically correct if you break God's law. Yeah, and then you will be in opposite to God. Yes, because opposite. Satan in the occult society says, do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. Mm. So we can be sure that Babylon is a transgressor of God's law by definition. And obviously there's a clash of worlds. Mm -hmm. Why are we called clash of minds, Martin? Because there is two mindsets in the world and they clash. They clash, yes. So we have a clash of worlds. Matthew 6, 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Is the earth doing the will of God as it is in heaven? No. No. Mark 3 verse 35, For so ever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. So how do we qualify to be counted as God's children? You have to do His will. All right. Let's make sure. Ephesians 6 verse 6, Not with eye service, as men pleases, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. So not what men want, but what God wants. Correct. Or Hebrews 10 verse 36. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, you might be, receive the promise. Martin, is it conditional? Yes. Yes, you don't receive the promise unless you do the will of God. No, and as we've mentioned before in the previous episodes, all these uh, about um, if you do, there is a requirement. In a anybody has a requirement. Even Babylon has a requirement. Yes, but they, they ignore the requirements of God and implement their requirements. That's it. So even if you want to be part of their system, you're going to have to adhere to requirements. Yes. Or 1 Peter 2 verse 15. For so it is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Or verse 17 from chapter 3, For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Have people suffered throughout the ages because of Babylon? We can look at the world today, and it's a consequence of the Babylonian doctrine. Yes. 1 John 2 verse 17, And the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Martin, the Bible is so clear. It's a choice. Romans 2 verse 7, To them who by patience continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. It's, it's a theme throughout the Bible. 
James 2 verse 8, if you fulfill the royal law, that's the law of ten commandments, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. Love thy neighbor as thyself is a short summary of the second table of the Decalogue. That's it. How do you react to your neighbor? And the first table is how do you react towards God? Yeah. All right, so what is the opposite of doing well? Second Kings, verse 13 of chapter 17. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Martin, can it be clearer than that? Not at all. Well, it can. It's a little bit shorter. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Yes, and if you don't <laughs> do it and you say you don't have to, you're a liar. Right? One John. Martin, it's very clear. It's, it's a battle between two mindsets. Now let's continue with Revelation chapter 18 because that angel is not finished. We're yeah. not going to go through the entire chapter, mm -hmm. but we want to get the gist of it. Reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her double according to her works in the cup which she has filled, filled to her double. But there must be a reason why God is so harsh with Babylon, right? Mm -hmm. How much she has glorified herself and live deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen, and then I am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. She's very full of herself. Mm -hmm. She thinks she has everything under control, and she's not a widow. She yeah. has a husband, but unfortunately she has the wrong husband. The dragon is her husband. Yeah. It should have been Christ, because she presents herself as a Christian organization. That's it. With all her other affiliates around her, like her children. And then, therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burnt with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. And what in the Bible calls her a prostitute? Mm -hmm. The punishment for prostitution was stoning. Unless it was the daughter of a priest, then the punishment was burning. Yeah. So Martin, she is a priest. She's yeah. a church. Mm -hmm. Therefore, her punishment is burning. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. She will be exposed. And this is only... When the plagues start falling. Right at the end, they will see her destruction and they will wail. Mm. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon. It's interesting that the alas is also repeated. Exactly. Huh? Also There's two twice. of them. Fallen, fallen, alas, alas, because it was church and state yeah. in union. That's why the kings are wailing, because they know that they are also lost. The church and the state has fallen with Babylon. That mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Martin, this system is going to be destroyed. We need to know why. And that's why there's a call to get out. Yes. Come out. If we pick up the story in Revelation chapter 17, verse 6, and I saw the woman, which is this church, drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Martin, if anybody wants to know just a tiny fraction of her evil deeds, then read Fox's Book of Martyrs. True. I've tried a few times to finish that book. This book is amazing. And you know, in the early portion of Protestantism's mm. existence. This book, together with the Bible, stood side by side on the shelves yeah. so that nobody would forget that this woman, this church, Roman Catholicism, was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. How they tortured millions of mm. people. How the Inquisition ruthlessly put them on the rack 
burnt them with fire. Mm. Uh, the most horrendous tortures. I mean, we've shown in other lectures the horrible instruments yeah. that they used. Martin, her cup is full. How That's can she ever, ever make good what she has done throughout the centuries? So Martin, the announcement of the fall of Babylon is to be repeated by the angel of Revelation 18 and after the message of the third angel has completed his work. The message will add power to the message of the third angel and will constitute the loud cry before the great and terrible day of the Lord. It's the last invitation to humanity. Separate yourselves, come out of her. That's it. And this is already in its infant cell. Yes. Who do you separate yourself to? Those who keep the commandments mm -hmm. and have the faith of Jesus. That's it. That's it. Revelation 18, 1, 2, and 4 quote that this scripture points forward to a time when the announcement of the fall of Babylon, as made by the second angel of Revelation 14, is to be repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the various organizations that constitute Babylon since that message was first given in the summer of 1844. These announcements, uniting with the third angel's message, constitute the final warning to be given to the inhabitants of the earth. Martin, this is it. This is the final message. That's it. It is the loud cry. You either listen to it and adhere to it and act upon the promptings of the Holy Spirit, or you will receive the doctrines of devils mm -hmm. and a false spirit. And it will show it is part of the message to show since 1844 how the organizations, churches, and everybody has come back to this beast power. Correct. All right. Revelation 18.11. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. So the economy cannot be separated from Babylon either. No. Martin, are you very happy with the way the economy is being run in the world? No, it's terrible. Uh, is it very pleasant when you go to the, the gas filling station and you have to fill up and you see that everything has doubled and tripled in the last few days and they're having fun, right? Correct. Everything increases and that's uh, because of all sorts of factors that even don't make sense. That don't even exist, yeah. yes. But you'll just, just have close to off pipelines or whatever you want to do. But let's not go into that. No, but this just In means it shows you your hands are cut off. You're totally dependent upon the system. Now, when there's a marvelous typology in the Bible where in the Old Testament there were similar situations which point to a greater reality at the end of mm -hmm, time mm -hmm. and explain these things in some detail. I wish we had time to go through chapters 26, 27, and 28 of the book of Ezekiel. But there this typology is presented in so much detail. It's amazing. Let's just look for, at a few snippets. Ezekiel 26. Now these chapters deal with two entities, mm -hmm. the prince of Tyre and the king of Tyre. Yeah. But they, of course, are typological of greater realities. So thus says the Lord God to Tyrus, Shall not the isles shake at the sound of thy fall, when the wounded cry, when the slaughter is made in the midst of thee? Then all the princes of the sea, now the sea represents the nations. Yes. In, in biblical prophecy, the waters you saw are peoples and multitudes and nations and kings, right? So the princes of the sea, so the entire world, all the nations, shall come down from their thrones and lay away their robes and put off their broidered garments. They shall clothe themselves with trembling. They shall sit upon the ground and shall tremble at every moment and be astonished at thee. So the princes of the world were in cahoots with Tyre, mm -hmm. which is a type of Babylon. And Tyre is also just another name for Tyrus. Tyrus. So that's the city that was destroyed, mm. and there was a prophecy that it would be thrown into the midst of the sea. That prophecy took more than three centuries before it was fulfilled to the T. Yeah. 
But we're not going into those details. Amazing prophecy. This also sounds similar to wandering after the beast. All right. So you had the kings of the world committing fornication with her and the princes of the sea, seafaring. Uh, we're under maritime law, for example, <laughs> today. It is a marine system. But that's a very long story. Now thou, son of man, take up a lamentation for Tyrus and say unto Tyrus, O thou that art situate at the entry of the sea, which art a merchant of the people for many isles. So here is this merchant aspect that we picked up in Revelation chapter 18. Mm -hmm. Thus says the Lord God, O Tyrus, thou hast said, I am of perfect beauty. Thy borders are in the midst of the sea. Thy builders have perfected thy beauty. Isn't this what Babylon boasted about? Yes, but all, and if you just look at the glitter. Yes. And the ships of Tarshish did sing of thee in thy market, and thou wast replenished and made very glorious in the midst of the sea. So here is this system that controlled the economy. All the inhabitants of the isle shall be astonished at thee, and their kings shall be sore afraid. They shall be troubled in their countenance. The merchants among the people shall hiss at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. This was the type. Mm -hmm. And the antitype is what's happening now in Babylon. Yes. And then if you continue in that chapter, then you will see all the nations being listed, one after the other. And sadly... Judah and the people of God as well. Yeah. Also being locked into the system. And then it comes to this prince and this king. Ezekiel 28. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus. Thus says the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what the prince of Babylon is saying as well. Exactly. He's saying, I sit as queen, I shall never be a widow or suffer loss of children. And he sits in the seat of God, saying that he is God. Yes. Thessalonians. Yet thou art the man and not God. Thou that set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. That's a big statement. This guy's informed. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. He is partaker of all the secrets and secret societies. And you can even say with surveillance. Yes. So who is this prince of Tyrus in modern terms? Well, he is the prince of the Babylonian system. And today that would be the Pope. The Pope. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding thou hast gotten thee riches and has gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. The richest system on earth is the Vatican. The Vatican, definitely. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic, hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, is going to be destroyed, right? Mm. So, does the papacy claim... The position of deity. Definitely. All right, let's look at this quote from Pope Leo. He claims divinity. Besides the numerous medieval papal claims to being God on earth, modern popes have not distanced themselves from such claims. Pope Leo said these things about the role of the papacy and the Roman Church. Our thoughts went out towards the immense multitude of those who are strangers to the gladness that filled all Catholic hearts. Some because they lie in absolute ignorance of the gospel, others because they dissent from the Catholic belief, though they bear the name of Christians. This thought has been and is a source of deep concern to us. What a blasphemy. <laughs> With a capital U. Yes. Let us make man mm. in our image. For it is impossible to think of such a large portion of mankind deviating as it were from the right path and they move away from us, capitalized, and not experience a sentiment of innermost grief. But since we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty, they reckon they have this power. This is such a blasphemous statement. 
We can show others that are much worse. That's we it. hold upon this place. What other can you make of me but God? I mean, they have so many statements. We don't have to read them all. And just important, like you mentioned in the opening of that um, paragraph, they haven't distanced themselves no. of this yet. So people say, but you know, those are the medieval popes. Mm. They are infallible, remember? That's it, ex cathedra. So let's go to a more modern pope. Let's look at what John Paul II had to say. In other Catholic answer tracts, we have shown that the church fathers recognized that Jesus made Peter the rock on which he would build his church, that this gave Peter a special primacy, that Peter went to Rome and that he left successors there, which is, of course, a load of nonsense yeah. because the rock is always Jesus Christ. So Peter had to find that Jesus was the son of the living God. Mm -hmm. He was the Messiah. Yeah. And Jesus answered, on this rock, on this statement, the church is built. Yes, so, so, so Jesus actually said to Peter, I am the rock, yes. and on this church we yes. will build. You Correct. are Peter, the pebble. The pebble. So they claimed this power to themselves. And in this track, we show that they also understood that Peter's successors shared in his special authority or primacy. In a wide variety of ways, the fathers attest to the fact that the Church of Rome was the central and most authoritative church. They note, as Ignatius of Antioch does, that Rome holds the presidency amongst other churches. And as Irenaeus explains, because of its superior origin, all the churches must agree with Rome. Mm. Modern, this is modern history. Nobody can say that the Church of Rome has changed. This is arrogance of the highest order. And all systems are part of this whole. Yeah. Correct. That's why they have this Babylonian ecumenical system. Mm. And that's why they can add this sentence. They are also clear on the fact that it is communion with Rome and the Bishop of Rome that causes one to be in communion with the Catholic Church. Martin, you have to be fratelli tutti. To which be is, of course, we've dealt with that. You cannot yeah. do that. You have to, that's, uh, if, and everybody, that's why this message is, come out of her, my people. And you know, even if Pope Francis himself hasn't stood on the stage and said, I am God, he certainly does it here. He has the arrogance to sit on a great white throne with four living creatures around him and two cherubs covering him. That is the depiction of God yeah. sitting on his great white throne. Martin, this is arrogance. This is blasphemy. So Pope Francis leads the celebration of the Vespers of Solemnity of the Conversion of St. Paul in 2014, concluding the week of prayer for Christian unity. Mm -hmm. While he sits on the throne as God, what a blasphemy. Yeah. Would you so, want to be part of the system? So you see, if you're in unity with this, you acknowledge what he's doing. Absolutely. So let's go and look at the king of Tyre. So the prince is his representative. Mm -hmm. Now who's the king of Tyre? Mm -hmm. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus says the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Then it mentions all the stones. And it says, The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. This is Satan being described here when he was still Lucifer. Yeah. He's the king of Tyre. That's it. Now who gives the beast its power and great authority? The dragon. The dragon. So you had the two. You had the prince and you had the king. Mm -hmm. You have the beast, which is the prince, and you have the king, which is the dragon or Satan. Same system. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee by the multitude of thy merchandise. Mm. Once again. He's again a dealer. 
They have filled the midst of thee with violence, thy sin. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Can we see, Martin, that Revelation 18 is the antitype of these chapters in Ezekiel? No, definitely, yeah. Right? Mm. And the, the consequences will be the same. The same. Total destruction. It's, it's almost as if God wants to make it very clear. He gave you a type, an antitype, and then he confirmed it in Revelation. So we read that Babylon deteriorates to the point where they become a house of demons. Now, they've always been a house of demons, hmm. but they added to their numbers, and the Protestants joined them and sacrificed upon the altar of iniquity the beautiful doctrine of justification by faith. Yeah. You become part of Babylon, and the result is you become a house of demons. So, Martin, in today's world, if you want to do what the Bible says, you are branded a fundamentalist, right? Mm -hmm. So the papacy, if they have moved away from God's word, must condemn anyone who adheres to the word of God He's, as a fundamentalist. That's it. So actually a fundamentalist was a good word yes. for a Christian. But it's become a swear word. Now it's become a swear word because it's totally negating what the papacy wants you to do. Correct. So I would like to say to the papacy publicly, I'm a fundamentalist. I'm very proud of it because I believe every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. I concur. You concur. You're in big trouble, Martin. Let's have a look. Well, just in, for interest's sake, this a few of the clips that we're going to show we, has been taken out of a documentary series that was made by Chris Lang, uh, Mystified. It's a very good series, and I'll put the um, link to it, it's available to watch on YouTube. Yes, I think it's wonderful that that link is there. People can look at it. It's very well done. Stephanie is a fundamentalist, a term originating in early 20th century Protestantism to describe Christians who believe that the Bible is the absolute truth of God for mankind. Pope John Paul II tried to recast this term as evil. And in 1999, he urged an interfaith council of 200 religious leaders to condemn Christian fundamentalists. The group agreed that religious fundamentalists who refuse to go along with the global ecumenical movement are to be silenced. The Jesuit Pope Francis, who says his spirituality comes directly from Vatican II, carries the same message. A fundamentalist group, even if it strikes no one, is violent. We must be especially attentive to every type of fundamentalism. With the state of the world today, we need a moral voice like Pope uh, Francis. The focus on humanity is, is very critical right now because there's so much polarization and divisiveness and conflict in the world. In recent years, Pope Francis joined a coalition of leaders representing some of the largest and most powerful companies on earth. According to the press release, the partnership puts the coalition members under the moral guidance of the Pope. Pope Francis presents what appears to be a kinder, gentler papacy. After all, he says his spirituality comes directly from Vatican II. Has the papacy changed? No. The right to religious liberty is not a supposed right to error and has due limits which are inherent according to the requirements of the common good. Because of all these stories you've heard about Francis, about picking his friends up in his Popemobile and taking them and all that going out to visit people, this, he hasn't changed his spots. Martin, a leopard cannot change its spots, right? No. She's still the same. She hates the Bible, and the Bible-believing individuals. 
So if we can just make it also very plain, the, they hate those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Yes, and if somebody disbelieves that they hate the Bible, they hate a specific one. That's it. They hate the received text. Yes. And they have called the Bible, the King James in particular, that poisonous asp. And they, they claim that they want to destroy it. Yeah. So modern she has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And we have to look how this progressed. Yeah. And modern she has claimed that she will not suffer loss of children. And Ratzinger, mm -hmm. Pope Benedict, he's the one who said she's the mother of all the churches. She's not the sister. And the children must return to her. So Protestantism must come back as well as all the other churches that separated from her must come back. And she publicly in Revelation claims that she will not suffer loss of children. Yeah. They will come back. So when you return to Babylon, you become part of Babylon. So let's see how the churches have submitted again to the power of Babylon. And interesting. This is since 1844. Yes. It's all the corruption that has come in since 1844. Remember, the 1844, the ecumenical movement started. Yes. We had that quote in the previous lecture. And that's also when the three angels' messages had to be proclaimed again. Correct. Because that's when it started. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Wesley Granberg Michelson, the General Secretary of the Reformed Church in America. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Dr. Clifton Kirkpatrick, the stated clerk of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in the United States. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Dr. William J. Shaw, President of the National Baptist Convention, United States. Your Holiness, may I present Bishop James Leggett, General Superintendent of the International Pentecost Holiness Church. Your Holiness, may I present Dr. Leif Anderson, President of the National Association of Evangelicals. Your Holiness, may I present Bishop David H. Benke, President of the Atlantic District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Your Holiness, may I present Elder Bernice King, daughter of the civil rights leaders Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. Your Holiness, may I present the Right Reverend Mark Sisk, Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of New York. Have the children returned to the mother? The one after the other. So let's just, let's just listen to what Tony Palmer said. He's now dead, but uh, he represented the charismatic arm and then of the Protestants, and then, of course, the unification again with Rome. Yes. It's the glory. If you accept that Christ is living in me, and the presence of God is in me, and the presence of God is in you, that's all we need because God will sort out all our doctrines when we get upstairs. 1999, the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Lutheran Church signed an agreement that brought an end to the protest. Brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over. Is yours. Ho bisogno delle vostre preghiere. Io prego per voi, lo farò. Ma io ho bisogno delle vostre preghiere e pregare al Signore perché ci unisca tutti. Perché questo è un miracolo, il miracolo dell'unità è, è incominciato. Come on, the man asked us to pray for him. Oh, Father. And since we know not how to pray for him as we ought other than to agree with him in his quest and in, in his, his, his heart, for the unity of the body of Christ. So, Father, we just, all of us now, according to Scripture, when we know not how to pray as we ought, we pray for Him in the Spirit. We receive utterance in the Holy Ghost. We receive prayers of faith. We receive, sir, we receive words that are not our own. All of these leaders represent 
literally tens of thousands of people that love you, that believe God with you, and in answer to your request, we have just prayed for you and with you, and we did so in the Spirit. We thank God for you. And so, all of us declare together, be blessed. I'm telling you right now, heaven is thrilled over this. They have become a house of demons, a house of every unclean and detestable bird. Martin, this is very, very serious. And I cannot see heaven being thrilled over that. Heaven is aghast. Shivering. And the message has to go out. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. She has become a house of demon, a house of every unclean and detestable bird. Come out of her, my people, that you receive yeah. not of her plagues. For her sins have reached up to heaven. Martin, how are they going to achieve this? Well, number one, he was speaking in tongues, in a language that neither heaven nor angels understand. Not even himself. And Jesus has always appealed to the mind as well as the heart. And music is going to play a very important role because we read in Daniel chapter 3, verse 5, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, has set up. They've set up an image to the beast. That's it. They've become part of Babylon, and they're going to use music to hypnotize humanity into believing that it is the Holy Spirit when it is a foul spirit. No, definitely. Elvis would sometimes read passages to his audiences from Blavatsky's book, The Voice of the Silence. It's a book that promotes Eastern Hindu meditation as a path to self-realization. While the Beatles practiced and promoted Maharishi's transcendental meditation. While he was in India, John Lennon wrote to a fan, Transcendental meditation is not opposed to any religion. It is based on the basic truths of all religions. The common denominator, actual experience of God, known as Vatican II, launched in Rome with more than 2,000 Catholic bishops from around the world. Vatican II helped pave the way for interfaithism, promoting unity between the world's religions by sharing the Catholic Church's mystic treasures, that is, its contemplative traditions. The term contemplative life was historically related to various monastic orders of monks and nuns whose lifestyles are oriented towards ascetic practices and contemplative prayer, a form of mysticism. We were asked by the Vatican to, to get involved in dialogue with Eastern meditation and with Eastern monasticism as the area in which Christianity had the most common basis. According to Vatican II, they would play the main role in the evangelization of the world. And that's exactly what happened. We will now see how interfaithism promotes virtually the same worldview as witchcraft. Who are we? And most people don't know. You came forth from God. Your deepest DNA is divine. What you're doing in contemplation is moving to a level beneath your thoughts at the level of pure being, the level of, of really what we call pure consciousness. The mystical, contemplative, non-dual mind. And I use those three words interchangeably. They have the same thing. It's not just two. There's a communing, a fusing where you become aware of the very presence of God in you and as you. So it's all a matter of awakening. It's all a matter of awareness. And if you're accessing the now, God, being, consciousness, what is, use whatever word you're comfortable with, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. Richard Rohr is consistent with the book, The Common Heart, a 20-year review of annual interfaith summits 
with Buddhist, Hindu, Sufi, Muslim, Jewish, Christian, and Native American shaman participants, where they agreed that God is too big to fit into one religion. Spiritual authority is based on inner experience, and a person's soul is divine. That holy scriptures are only respected if they lead to the greater authority, self-knowledge. These concepts about God and the nature of man are identical to witchcraft, a form of shamanism. Martin, are they listening to doctrines of devils? Oh, for sure. And is it only Catholicism or all the religions, including Protestantism? That's it. All religions, including Protestantism, or Christianity for that matter. And you know, like you mentioned, it's so, they use music, even Christian music, to implement yes. these things. Now this music plays such an important role because it puts you into an altered state of consciousness. And whether you do that in a church setting, mm. whether you do that in a gambling hall, where you have this music that mm. puts you in an altered state of consciousness, or whether you go into a shopping mall, where you have all kinds of music that switches off your cognitive functions so that you become a, a purchasing robot. Yeah. And people get addicted to it. You do. They become mall addicts. And Ignatian spirituality is brought into the churches. Martin, Ignatian spirituality is Jesuit teaching emanating from demonic visions that the so-called Saint Ignatius Loyola had. So the spiritual exercises, this is a modern web page describing this, are a compilation of meditations, prayers, and contemplative practices developed by St. Ignatius Loyola to help people deepen their relationship with God. These are works. You go through phases. Mm -hmm. You use all your senses. You use the sense of sight. You use the sense of smell. You use the sense of taste and touch, and you place yourself into those situations, let's say a biblical scene, mm. and then you become a partaker of the scene and you communicate with the people around you, whether it be Mary or Joseph or Paul or whoever it is, and these people are dead. Therefore, you are communicating with demons and receiving demon instruction. You see, it's very scary because... It can, like you just mentioned it now, somebody will say, oh, but that's not what I'm doing. That's exactly what you're doing. But the problem can be that you don't have to do it in that state. You can just sit there and contemplating the whole time of what would be the message to you yes. and then concoct up something that's not even biblical. And one of the methods they use is repetitiveness. You have to repeat phrases or words or even one name even the name invoking the name of jesus for example you repeat it over and over and over and the bible says do not be like the pagans that repeat over and over yeah. because this puts you in an altered state of consciousness it may even be dangerous to read a, a chapter or a portion over and over and over and over because that can also happen then. well that's what they call divine reading they don't read what the bible says they read it as a mantra, mm. repeating it over. It's called Lecto Divina, reading, divine reading. It's demonic. The most common way of going through the exercises now is a retreat in daily life, which involves a month-long program of daily prayer and meetings with a spiritual director. Uh, the Bible says that if you listen to these people, other than the Word of God, it's sin. I need no spiritual director. I have a spiritual That's director. It. It's called the Word of God. Amen. Rick Warren in the Purpose Driven Church said that the spiritual formation movement had a vital message for the church and has given the body of Christ a wake-up call. The Saddleback Pastor Lance Witt writes about the contemplative prayer visualization in his article titled Enjoying God's Presence in Solitude. We are designed to enjoy the presence of God, but that's easier said than done. In this article, what uses Thomas Merton as an example of someone who knew about solitude, but Merton's solitude was connected to his Buddhist sympathy. And Merton likened contemplative prayer to an LSD trip. 
That's where you had the music of the Beatles, who, by the way, were Jesuit controlled. Mm -hmm. All of this come in. They have become a house of demons. And if you listen to the sweet contemplative music, Martin, it's hypnotic. Get out before you are hypnotized and caught. He finishes his article with the goal of solitude is not so much to unplug from my crazy world as it is to change frequencies, inducing alpha rhythms so that I can hear the Father. You are hearing demons, Martin. That's the problem. If, like you mentioned in a previous talk that we had, if you want to hear God speak, read the Bible out loud. Yes, exactly. So what does Rick Warren have to say on some of these issues? Let's listen. I am nothing but impressed by uh, this new pope. Amazing. First place, in my book, the three most important characteristics for leadership are humility, integrity, and generosity. And in the first months of his, uh, uh, of his leadership, he has shown those symbolically what he has done for a lifetime, okay? Uh, his humility of showing up, of, you know, paying his own uh, hotel bill yeah. and checking out, of, uh, you know, eschewing all of, the, all of the, the bling and the other things, the accoutrements of power, things like that. This is a man who spent his life working with the poor. Yeah. This is a man who I happen to admire because of his work with people with HIV AIDS. Yeah. And as you know, Saddleback has been involved in, in that. We just had World AIDS Day, yeah. where we, we've been real involved in helping try to remove the stigma and end getting to zero uh, by the end of, uh, uh, of this decade, if we can, on AIDS. And so his, his integrity, uh, I love the fact that before he starts talking about uh, you know, businessmen being greedy, he talks about bishops being greedy, right. okay? And, and, and before he starts talking about uh, the low morals in the world, he talks about the low morals in the church, okay? Uh, let's do a little house cleaning at home first. And, and, and also, I, I love that. Yeah. So is this so-called Protestant preacher praising the Pope? Yeah. And they show, Martin, the Pope washing the feet of the, the poor people, right? Yeah. Now he's taking the place of Jesus Christ. Yes, because... Because he's another Christ on earth, after all. He mm -hmm. sat on a great white throne, right? And Martin... White. Jesus was the only one mm -hmm. who washed the feet of the disciples, but his feet weren't washed. Yes. It wasn't necessary to wash his feet because he had no sin in him. That's it. But the papacy does the same thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Bible says that we are to wash each other's mm -hmm. feet, but he's above his feet being washed because he's taking the place of Christ. He's the Antichrist. Yeah. The plea of the prophets, Isaiah 48 verse 20. Go ye forth of Babylon, flee ye from the Chaldeans with a voice of singing, declare ye, tell this, utter it, even to the end of the earth. Say ye, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. Martin, this is Isaiah speaking. This is before the Babylonian captivity. And he's warning, yeah. flee from Babylon. Jeremiah 51 verse 6, flee out of the midst of Babylon. God repeats the message. Yeah. This is in the time when the captivity actually happened, when Jerusalem fell. And deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. That was the type. We are living in the anti-type. So let's read these quotes from the book Prophets and Kings. Those whose spirit God had raised, quoting Ezra 1 verse 5, returned under the decree of Cyrus. But God ceased not to plead with those who voluntarily remained in the land of exile. And through manifold agencies, he made it possible for them also to return. However, the larger number of those who failed to respond to the decrees remained unimpressible. And even when Zechariah warned them to flee from Babylon, they did not heed the invitation. That is a scary type. And I'm afraid we're going to have a similar outcome today. And then came a death decree. Meanwhile, conditions in Medo-Persia were changing rapidly. Darius 
Estapes was succeeded by Xerxes the Great. During his reign, those who had failed to flee were called on to face a terrible crisis. Having refused the way of escape God had provided, now they were brought face to face with death mm -hmm. because there was a death decree. Is there going to be a death decree again? Yes. So if you don't want to heed the call, come out, you're going to be caught in the same problem. As an article in the Review and Herald, through the prophet Zechariah, as well as by the late experience in his troublous times of Esther and Mordecai, God had plainly warned his people to flee from Babylon. The time had come when it was perilous to dwell longer in the midst of heathen influence. In view of these changed conditions, the priests in Babylon should have been quick to discern in the call who is on the Lord's side, a special call to them to return to Jerusalem. So we have a special call to return to the ways of God, mm. to keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus, to keep the commandments of God, to have the faith of Jesus. That's it. Revelation 18, verse 11, And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. So Martin, in that video we saw that the Pope had an accord with all the merchants of the earth. Mm -hmm. And whose morality must they follow? His. His. Yeah. Verse 12, the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thine wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and of iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flavor and wheat and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and the souls of men. Mm. That covers about everything, right? That's it. And but their greatest merchandise is? The souls of men. This is terrible. And they do it literally as well, with human trafficking. With trafficking, we got that word also in the previous slide. Right. So if we turn to Revelation 17 for a little bit of help, it says there, and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. So that church that controls the nations. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. What a terrible depiction. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colors and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Martin, does the papacy have this attire? By now, I think people can start realizing for themselves ezekiel all of and revelation every time you can see the depiction now of what's describing this beast yes having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of a fornication but they're so arrogant that the roman church is the only one that depicts herself as a woman carrying a golden cup if you walk into the vatican and you turn right into the side chamber there's a huge statue of the woman with the golden cup in her hand. There's also the depiction, of course, of Martin Luther and Calvin being yeah. uh, obliterated. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery. She's a secret society. She has an external and an internal doctrine. Exoteric and esoteric. Correct. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and an abominations of the earth. She's the mother. And the others, no matter what they are, no matter what you call the religious systems, no matter how many millions of adherents they have, mm. they're children of hers. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Martin, I would also wonder at the long suffering of God. That's true. Huh? And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. So this woman, this church that controls the beasts, the political systems of the world, and the consciences of men. Yeah. She was identified very clearly. 
Martin Luther showed the woman riding the beast and the kings of the world bowing down to her, and he made very sure that he put the papal triple tiara on the woman's head. Mm -hmm. Was the world warned? Yes. Have they forgotten? They have. They've returned, like we've shown, since the messages went out. just bless the Pope? Just go on, back. Babylon has become a house of demons. And this depiction in Martin Luther's Bible of the two witnesses, the Old and the New Testament, and their adversary, the dragon with the triple crown on his head. And then they put pressure on him and he had to remove it and they put a kingly crown on there and Martin Luther was very upset. So he had it redrawn with a massive triple tiara on the dragon's head. That's the enemy, the dragon and the papacy, those two. And Martin, you can think all the other religions are the enemies, maybe even terrorists and whatever. And you can give them whatever names you like. They're all part of the system of Babylon and they're all part of those brethren, the Fratelli Tutti. Yeah. Have nothing to do with them. Come out of her, Come my out. people. Be not partaker of her sins because they are the sworn enemies of the two witnesses, the Bible and the Bible alone. The Old and the New Testament, the type and the anti-type. So Martin, can we say that they are in rebellion against the Word of God? Oh, definitely. 1 Samuel 15 verse 23, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. Is God rejecting another king here? Yes, even the king of Tyre. You know, Martin, God is so faithful. He wants everybody to understand. And there are messages that are coming out in the world which should horrify people and make them take a second look, but they don't. This is new information, 28 October 2023. The Spanish church sexual abuse affected 200,000 children, commission finds. More than 200 thousand children are estimated to have suffered sexual abuse from Spain's Catholic clergy and independent commission has found. Now, Martin, this can happen in any church, mm -hmm. but at this level? I don't know. 200,000 children abused in Spain? And this consistency. Yes. There's another article, also new. Over 4,000 children abused by Portugal's Catholic church. A commission investigating the issue said 77% of perpetrators were priests and most of the victims were men. Martin, this is terrible because the Bible actually describes that yeah. people are being victimized. The souls of men. And human trafficking yeah. takes place in these organizations and it's glossed over with a, an apology. What about Canada's residential schools? They were a place of horror. Founded to carry out the genocide of indigenous people, they created conditions that killed thousands of children. Editors note, this story is being republished in the light of Pope Francis's visit to Canada to apologize to the indigenous community for more than a century of abuses by missionaries or residential schools across the country. It is replete in history. If you go to the Middle Ages, what happened in those monastic systems? Mm. What happened in the dungeons of those places where they had the, the little children that were being sacrificed there? It is a horrendous system. That's why monastic systems were abolished in England for a time. And the horrendous things that went on over there was just beyond compilation. And the mysticism that was yeah. involved. And it, and it is a form of sex worship, this pagan worship. We saw that also in the, in the previous episode. That's part of the old Babylonian worship. And systems. sacrificing of children was part of it. Now, I don't, we don't want to go into all of those details. But this system has become a house of demons. She is a house of every unclean and detestable bird. And anybody who associates with her willingly, praises her, mm. bows down to her, is an enemy of God. Here's an article. What does a plenary indulgence mean? 
liability insurance for our sins. Martin, this is in our time. This is 2022. Yeah. All believers who attend Pope, the Pope's ceremony on World Day of Grandparents and the Elderly on July 24, 2022, or in one of the events taking place around the world, can purchase a plenary indulgence. How would you describe that? You pay and have your sins forgiven? There's a connection between indulgences and forgiveness of sins. But if I am granted an indulgence, then my sins are not forgiven, but rather it is the remission of temporal punishments for sins. That is, there's a difference between forgiveness and making amends for harm. Now, these indulgences are taking place under the direction of Pope Francis. Yes, so it's not something of the Middle Ages. No. And now, why are they doing this so publicly? They are rubbing it into the face of the Protestants, saying, we don't care that you exposed us. You are back with us, and we will show you that we have not changed. You know how ridiculous this becomes? Yeah. Then I have a system, Martin, mm. that on a Friday, the church bells will ring yeah. to commemorate, so they say, the death of Jesus on the cross. And if during that period when the bells are ringing, you say five Our Fathers, then you receive an indulgence, See. a complete remission of the punishment of sin. This is such a blasphemy. This is such a stupidity that Protestants should go along with this is just astounding to me and still continue with the ecumenical movement? No, and unfortunately, like we've shown in the previous one that has to do with the mark, if you want to for, take their excuses for keeping the mark, that Sunday worship, then unfortunately... You are adhering to the system. You are worshipping the beast. Before he was expelled from heaven, Satan had an acquaintance with God. He knew his character, but ever since then his effort has been to misrepresent that character. It is at his suggestion that religion has been made a series of penances and mortifications or of a splendid sights and pageantries there are many forms of religion instituted by the enemy of God that are as Christless as was the offering of Cain. All of these activities to receive remission are as Christless as was the offering of yeah. Cain. And can you imagine a Protestant minister partaking in an ecumenical process, bowing down to images? Can you imagine that yeah. happening in the world today? That is a blasphemy against God. I am horrified. So when we talk about Revelation chapter 18, the whole chapter shows that Babylon that has fallen is the churches who will not receive the message of warning the Lord has given in the first, second, and third angel's messages. When the bell rings, say, five our fathers is to take the place of the righteousness of Christ. Yeah. How low can you fall? They refused the truth and accepted a lie. They refused the message of truth. See Thessalonians 2, where the Antichrist is clearly defined. He sits in the temple of God, in the church of God, pretending that he is God. The message in the 18th chapter of Revelation is plain and clearly defined. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacy. Anyone who reads this chapter need not be deceived. The wine of Babylon is the exalting of the false and spurious Sabbath above the Sabbath which the Lord Jehovah has blessed and sanctified for the use of man. Also the immortality of the soul. Now we spoke about that mm -hmm. when we spoke about the mark of the beast. These kindred heresies and the rejection of truth convert the church into Babylon. Kings, merchants, rulers, and religious teachers are all in corrupt harmony. We've seen them. Yeah. And what will be the result, Martin? Revelation 16, verse 12. 
And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east may be prepared. The great river Euphrates, they're all excited now because it is rit literally drying yeah. up because they built a dam. Yeah. That's not what's meant here. That's not what's meant here. Literal Babylon is gone. The waters you saw are the multitudes that fed her. Yeah. So the waters represent peoples and nations and multitudes and kings. But those waters will dry up. And this is at the end. When the plagues fall, Martin, they will see that God was not in that movement. And the kings of the east, and I saw the glory of the God of Israel come from the way of the east. And this is this. so important because these charismatic churches that want to say that the kings of the east are China and Russia. Nothing to do with them. And then I saw the unclean frets like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon. That's all the spiritualistic religions, the contemplative prayer and all that nonsense that we just saw. And out of the mouth of the beast that tells you that you can get remission from the punishment of your sins mm. by just visiting an elderly person. What a load of nonsense. I'm not saying don't visit an elderly person, by the way. No. And out of the mouth of the false prophet, we saw the Kenneth Copelands and the Rick Warrens and the way that they speak and are telling you that this is the way, the truth, and the life. No, Jesus is the way, the mm -hmm. truth, and the life. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. This is the clash of minds. That's it. This is the battle of Armageddon. This is where you have to make your decision. You either stay with the system or you come out. Jeremiah 51 verse 9 says, We would have healed Babylon, but she's not healed. Martin, she cannot be healed. There's no peace to be made between Christ and Satan. No. Get well, behind one of them. You have to yield to one of them. That's why you have to forsake her. and Let us go everyone unto his own country, for her judgment reach unto heaven and is lifted up even to the skies. Revelation 19 verse 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Martin, the religious systems are going to be destroyed. Yes. It's interesting the dragon is not there. No. Because he's still going to survive for a millennium. For a thousand years. But there will be no one to deceive because they'll all be dead. True. There will be no thousand years of peace down here. That's a false Jesuitical doctrine that's also been swallowed by Protestantism. It's part of the wine of Babylon. So Martin, to sum it up, this other angel says Babylon has fallen. And he gives a view of all the corruptions that have come into the churches since the first announcement of Babylon. Yeah. Now Martin, God has been so good. He has repeated this message over and over that people should get it. The Protestant Reformation defined it very clearly. Yeah. Protestants forgot. In 1844, the message was repeated. Mm -hmm. They refused to go along with it. They went into the ecumenical movement. Yes. And now this is the final call. This is the final this call. This is the final call. This is the loud cry. Either we accept this message and separate ourselves from Babylon and join up with those who keep the commandments and have the faith of Jesus, or we receive the plagues. May God give us wisdom to make the right choice. Shall we pray? Please. Heavenly Father, what a powerful warning. And a warning that comes from a heart of love because it has been repeated over and over and over again. Not only has it been repeated, it has been defined over and over again. And nobody wants to do it. Please, Lord, send your spirit that people may make the right choices. My prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.